Hi, my name is Jim and uh, today's topic is uh, power factor, specifically power factor correction. And what this is about is when we have um, a situation where the current and voltage are not in phase. And the problem with this is it causes the electric company some discomfort, which ultimately re reflect back not into a residential um, place, but into a commercial enterprise, say like a machine shop. So for an example, suppose in your house you have a perfect capacitor, um, there's no resistance in it whatsoever, and the value is such that you're drawing 20 amperes from 120 volts. Now, what we know about capacitors is that the current's going to lead the voltage by 90 degrees, um, and if we were to go through the voltage waveform in black and the current waveform in green, and multiply each point together is what we would find that is when the current and the voltage are both positive we end up with a positive number. When the voltage is positive and the current is negative we end up with a negative number. When the current is negative and the voltage is negative we end up with a positive number. And when the current is positive and the voltage is negative we end up with a negative number. Now the positive means that we're using energy and the negatives means that we're giving energy back to the electric company. So the net result of this is our electric meter on our house doesn't move at all. Even though we have 20 amps of current um, flowing through it. So the, uh, the issue here is that the electric company has their transmission facility that comes into our house and this goes probably through several transformers and who knows how far and they have to basically eat or lose money on the I squared R cost of the transmission facility. So we're using, I didn't say using, we're drawing 20 amperes and it's costing the power company money. Now, a typical question is how can I do this and get something useful out of it? And the answer is you can't. Anytime you do anything over here, say, to produce light or heat or whatever, as the current shifts toward the voltage and the electric meter begins to move. So um, there's no, no free ride in this. Realistically, we can't have a perfect capacitor anyway, but if we're talking about a large building where we're talking of hundreds, maybe thousands of amperes, um, the I squared R loss of the electric company is a significant concern. And what will happen in an enterprise like this is that the cost per kilowatt hour would be increased if the current and the voltage are significantly out of phase. So electricity costs you more money. And that's not a good thing. So the relationship between the uh, phase of the current and voltage is called the power factor. And it's Power factor is also used in power supply design where it's desired to keep the current flowing for 360 degrees as opposed to what we learned in half wave and full wave rectifiers, but that's not what we're interested in here. We're interested in an industrial environment, so our power factor is going to be equal to the cosine of the angle, and the angle is going to be between the voltage and the current, and we have to note that PF, if the power factor equals 1.0, it's a resistive circuit. Um, <clears throat> the voltage and current are exactly in phase. Second definition of power factor is the real power divided by the apparent power. Now we're going to learn what apparent power is coming up um, very shortly. So let's suppose that we have say a machine shop and looking in to their from their electric meter we see that they have a J 10 uh, inductive component and a 13 ohm resistive component. Now these are unrealistic because they're extremely high, but they represent every single thing in that shop, from cooling fans, light bulbs, whatever. And these numbers are just going to be easier to work with than milli ohms or micro ohms or whatever. So um, if we wrote this down in rectangular form, it's straightforward, 13 plus J10. And we're going to have some general calculations to do here, just common stuff, so we'll get that out of the way up front here. The impedance in polar form, we're starting out with R plus J X of L, 
is equal to the square root of the sum of the uh, squared values inverse tangent of the imaginary over the real and that gives us an impedance of 16.4 ohms and an angle of 37.57 degrees ohms so that tells us by the positive angle there that this is an inductive circuit and then we might as well find the current flowing since we're doing this and that's simply going to be V over Z so we have 120 at a reference 0 degrees volts divided by our impedance and we end up with 7.32 at negative 37.57 um, amperes and the current is lagging the voltage so it's um, definitely an inductive circuit uh, now we got to take this and do something with it and before we can do that is we have to define a few things first we have P and this is called real power and uh, the unit for that as you know is watts possibly a new term S S is the symbol for apparent power and it's measured in volt amperes so a watt you get in one form of it is multiplying the voltage by the current but this means something different it's for a resistive circuit would produce the same number but if we have a reactive element in it not so much not with real power being the issue finally we got another variable Q which is used in several different aspects of electronics and this is reactive power and its unit is VAR so that's volt amperes reactive so if we were to determine that for our circuit we would see that P equals I squared R and this is the value we just calculated on the previous page times 13 ohms gives us 696 watts so this is the real component and if this were in a resident a residential house with a power meter um, that's what you'd be paying for the apparent power S easiest way you can find that is just V times I which is 120 volts appearing at the building's interface with uh, 7.32 amperes and that gives us 878.4 VA now notice that there's a significant difference between the two of those further if we were to find the reactive power Q equals I squared X again current squared times 10 ohms gives us 535.8 VAR now I've used the power equations here there are three different forms of them and you can use basically anything you want um, if I knew the voltage across the resistance I could use V squared over R it, it doesn't matter it's what's easiest to use what do you have available so what's the power factor of our little building there that we had on the previous sheet so power factor equals real power divided by apparent power and we do the division we come out to be 0 0.79 and it's a unitless number uh, power factor is also equal to the cosine of the angle and if we do that we get 0 0.79 so it's good that they both produce the same answer so one way of expressing this is using a power triangle and you may have covered this in AC circuits maybe not but it's very similar to an impedance diagram it's right angle trig and the real power we're going to let be on the real axis and that's 696 watts and then for the reactive power this is going to be going up on the plus J axis which is really over here but I drew it like this because I have to make a triangle and that was our 535.8 VAR and then the apparent power is going to be the hypotenuse S and that's the 878.4 VA so by the direction of Q here uh, we know that it's an inductive load so we could say if we wanted to is that S equals the parent power equals the real power plus or minus J meaning there's going to be an imaginary component Q and likewise we could solve for anything we wanted to knowing any of the two of these just by manipulating our variables and uh, being careful with the square roots so to go to do a check here we can say that P is equal to S squared minus Q squared and that would be solving for P here uh, square root of 878.4 squared minus our 535 squared gives us 696 watts.
So that seems to work out fine. Now for reference, if we have a capacitive uh, environment, the reactive power Q in VAR is going to be going in the other direction. And it's not likely to find an enterprise which has a capacitive flavor to it. So how do we correct this guy? And by correcting it, what we want to do is make the voltage and current in phase, so the phase angle is zero. So what we can guess is we have an inductor here in this branch. If we parallel with a capacitor, we might be able to cancel everything out, at least an inductive component. And we know from uh, Kirchhoff is that um, uh, the total coming in is broken into two components. One is the capacitor current, and the other is I'm calling I load because it's going through two components here. So uh, we want to know out uh, the, the effects of L here, and there's two methods to do that. So I'll start with one method, and this is a current method. So we know what the current is, and we know what the angle is. So we can break that current down into real and imaginary uh, components. So uh, all we have to do is take the magnitude of it and multiply it by the cosine of the angle, and the real component of the current expressed here in a current diagram is going to be 5.80 amperes. Likewise, we can find the imaginary component of the current, and that's basically the same formula, except now we're taking the sine of it, and that comes out to be a negative J 4.46 amperes. So he's going to be located here, and the uh, real component of the current will be located here, and then the 7.32 amps that we started with this guy is the hypotenuse, and uh, the angle in here is going to be our uh, 37.57 degrees. So all we did is basically decompose the current into its real and imaginary components. So if we want to balance this out to null out the inductive component here, we're going to let the capacitor current equal plus J 4.46 amperes if you see by the current diagram here is what we're going to do is basically cancel out the uh, inductive component of this, leaving us with a 5.80 ampere real component. So once I've got this diagram, everything kind of falls apart. So I now place the capacitor in parallel with the network here and let the current be equal to J4.46 and then just solve for some stuff. And the first thing we want to find is what is the capacitive reactance? Well, that's easy. It's V over I, uh, 120 over 4.46 amperes, and that comes out to be 26.89 ohms. Now note, the word capacitive reactance means that the angle is negative 90 degrees. So I don't have to specify any of that in there. It's embedded in the X sub C. So, once I know what the capacitive reactance is, all I have to do is solve for C. And uh, doing the math here, that comes out to be uh, 98.66 E negative 6, which we would represent correctly as uh, 98.66 microfarad. So, if we put that value across our load, our phase angle uh, would be 0 degrees. So just doing that mathematically, I total equals JIC minus JIL add together is zero plus the resistive current gives us the 5.80 amperes and the corrected uh, value of this are corrected so this is not going to be 13 ohms. After we correct it, it looks differently. So that's going to be 120 divided by our real current which is 5.8 ohms and the corrected current, uh, corrected resistance is 20.68 ohms. So, strange. When we put this in parallel, our resistive component increases. And now, I mean, this is basically what we're going to be paying for, is the product of 120 volts times 5.8 amperes. So this circuit now looks like this guy without any reactance in it whatsoever. So if we go to check this, we see that P equals V times IR, 120 times 5.8 amperes, gives us, in fact, 696 watts. I'm happy with that. P equals V squared over R equals 120 volts squared divided by our corrected 
resistance and that also gives us in this case 690 watts got a little round off going there but I'm happy with that so under corrected conditions the apparent power is equal to the real power and the power factor is equal to 1.0 Okay, second method is to take our series circuit and convert it into a parallel circuit. And once we get this, it's very simple to go forward and figure that out. Now, what to be careful of is that XLS, that's the inductive reactance series, is only equal to the inductive reactance parallel, supposed to be a P here, when the angle is 45 degrees. It's just the way it works. Likewise, the series resistance is only equal to the parallel resistance when the angle is 45 degrees. Under those circumstances of 45 degrees, the magnitude of X is equal to the magnitude of R. Under any other angle, these resistors will not be the same, nor the reactance of the series in parallel will not be the same. So, converting series to parallel, what we know from our previous calculations is the impedance was 16.4, 37.57 degrees ohms. And now we'll find the admittance, and the admittance is equal to the reciprocal of impedance. So I'm just going to represent the numerator as 1 at 0 degrees, and do the division. And this comes out to be 61.0 at negative 37.57 milli Siemens capital S. Okay, the real component of admittance is conductance. And uh, the symbol for conductance is G. And we'll just do the standard thing to find the real part of this is the cosine operator. So that would be equal to the admittance times the cosine of our negative 37.57 degrees. And that comes out to be 48.35 millisiemens. Now, once we've got the conductance, let's get the resistance here, and this is going to be RP, our parallel. So that's simply equal to the reciprocal of the conductance. And doing the math, that comes out to be 20.68 ohms. Sound familiar? Now we need to do the imaginary part, and that's going to be the susceptance, and the symbol for that is B. It's supposed to be a B. And the equation is the same, except now we're taking the sine operation of it. And that gives us a negative J, 37.2 millisiemens. So the inductive reactance parallel is going to be the reciprocal of the susceptance, 1 divided by, and that comes out to be J, 26.88 ohms. So um, now we're in position to redraw the circuit. I guess I didn't redraw the circuit. Well, let me redraw the circuit. 20.68, 26. 20. And this guy is um, J26. 0.88 ohms. There are little connection points there. So that's our parallel equivalent circuit, and this is only equivalent at one frequency, and that's going to be 60 hertz. Just thought I'd mention that. Uh, so if we look at the Z diagram, is we have the real component here, and the imaginary component here, which is our X parallel value. So we're now going to let x of c be equal to negative j 26.88 ohms. So we're doing the same basic thing we did before with current, except now we're doing it with reactants. And once we know what this is, we know what this is and just change the sign, and then solve for c as we did before, and that comes out to be uh, 98.68 microfarad. So uh, either, either method would work. So in this case, Z, the impedance, equals the resistance, equals 20.68 ohms. So there's no reactive component in this. And um, let me <laughs> kind of 
kind of put our C in here, which would have a negative J26.88. Don't want to forget him, or we've done all this work for nothing. Okay, under this circumstance, power factor is equal to 1, and if we do V squared is 100, uh, power equals V squared over R, 120 volts squared divided by our uh, parallel resistive value, 20.68 ohms as we did before, we get the same number we've been working with all evening, 696 watts, and the power triangle is not too exciting, just comes out on the reel. Um, with 696 watts. So two ways to correct the circuit. One is by taking the total current, breaking it down into real and imaginary components, and then adding in a capacitor current of the opposite direction. And then the other is to transform the diagram from a series into a parallel, and then just find out what the reactive element is of the parallel, and introduce a uh, another parallel part, the capacitor, of the opposite direction to basically add to zero. Now one more thing before we end this topic. This is a good time to kind of say this, more on volt amperes. And we'll start with a transformer, and we haven't discussed these yet, but this is a pretty simple example. We have a secondary here. This is called a primary winding, and we might connect this, say, to uh, 120 volts. So we have a 10 volt secondary and the transformer is designed and wound such that the wire can carry one ampere. So if a transformer has a secondary rating of 10 watts, under this circumstance it is fully loaded. We have a 10 ohm load, one ampere slowing, 10 volts, all is good. Now let us put a capacitor in here and let the capacitor reactance here be equal to 5 ohms. Now I don't know what value C is, but I could find out if I wanted to. But doesn't matter. So under this circumstance we have um, 10 volts divided by 5 ohms gives us 2 amperes flowing in the circuit. Now note this, the secondary power is 0 watts. It's not dissipating anything. However, 2 amperes is still flowing. The secondary is basically 20 VAR. So what we have here is the secondary winding is carrying two amperes, but it was designed for one ampere. So eventually the transformer is going to fail. So when manufacturers make transformers, they don't specify that the secondary is so many watts, but they specify the secondary is in volt amperes. And that is to take care of situations like this. Because if this is rated in watts, I could say to a manufacturer, look, I didn't draw any power in a transformer burnout. And to an extent it's a valid argument, but it's out of the context of what the spec really means. So you'll see a lot of stuff on transformers in the unit will be VA now watts, and that is the reason why. So uh, that'll conclude on um, power factor correction. Thanks for watching.